which is the power of culture to transform lives. And I'm going to invite John Kelly, who is moderating this panel, to the stage. I presume John is here. Yeah, sorry, John. And I will also invite up Senator Fake McConnell. I hope I got that right, Fake, the director of the Abbey Theatre. Kathleen Paul, president of CineQuest. Jim Sheridan, Irish film director and 16-time Academy Award nominee. <laughs> and Roisin O, who is an Irish singer and songwriter who studied in San Jose and whom I had the honor some years ago to sit beside at the Spirit of Ireland dinner in San Jose. Roisin O. And I'm going to hand over to your moderator, John Kelly, Irish broadcaster, Two on, two on either side, yeah. All right. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the All Ireland United States Sister Cities Mayor's Summit is all about uh, promoting economic, social, educational, cultural cooperation, and uh, we're now going all cultural. This is a remarkable event. It's remarkable for one main reason, and people from Ireland will get this that if Hermana Man is in Croke Park at all, it's fairly extraordinary. <laughs> And the sun shining, too. Um, the title of this debate is The Power of Culture to Transform Lives. And we have a very cultured panel. Panelists, I'm glad and relieved to say, know the onions when it comes to culture, what it really means, what it does, what it can achieve, how it is used, and, and I suppose often how it is abused. Um, Kathleen Powell, President Cinequest, Senator Faith, Mac Faith McAneil, who is uh, Director of the Abbey Theatre, um, there's some dispute as to just how many nominations and awards Jim Sheridan has won. There seems to be a, there's a contradiction there. Multi-nominated, multi multi-award winning Jim Sheridan and from the celebrated ranks of, uh, of Irish musicians, uh, Roisin, Roisin O. Each of our four speakers will make a five-minute address outlining their beliefs and so on, and this discussion will continue and then will be opened up to the floor as well. I am under very strict instructions uh, and a very strict email from the organizers, five minutes, five minutes only, and this is the worrying bit, it is my responsibility as moderator, quote. They were very heavy about it. <laughs> so um, I don't know how that's going to work out because I know some of these people, and five minutes, five minutes won't be enough. Um, Kathleen, I believe you're going first, is that correct? I, I'd be happy to. Okay. So. My name is Kathleen Powell. I'm co-founder of CineQuest. And we were having an interesting discussion right before uh, we came out about culture and what is it really, because it means many different things to many different people. And for the sake of how I look at it, you know, I think about it being um, attitudes and customs and beliefs that's common to a group of people. And that's passed down generation to generation through things like language and objects, you know, material objects, um, as well as art. And so Cinequest, what is Cinequest? Um, it's a company in Silicon Valley whose focus is around innovation and creativity coming together to empower and transform lives. So how do we do this? We do it through a global youth program called Picture the Possibilities, where we teach young people in Beijing and Mexico City and New York and LA how to create, the power of creating anything, anything you want in life. We do this through our studio, CineQuest Maverick Studios, where we produce and distribute film. And we do this through the CineQuest Film Festival, which is how we're best known in the world. It's 26 years old. It's been the top, in the top 10 film festivals in the world for quite a long time and recently voted number one by USA Today readers. So why did we choose film? So film is a media. It could be te for television. It could be for the theaters. It could be for virtual reality. It could be for the internet. But it's a medium where you can tell stories and share those stories and ideas to others. And you can share them globally. Why did we pick innovation? Because great technology companies, like we've talked about some already in the conference, the Intels and the Cisco's and the PayPal's that are based and headquartered in Silicon Valley, Hewlett Packard, but we also have the big media tech companies. So Google and Facebook, Apple, that are developing technology that allows you to create and connect globally. 
So at CineQuest, we champion these technologies and we share how to use those technologies to share stories and to share ideas. And then finally, we have a big live event. That's the third kind of part of the CineQuest Film Festival. And why are big global cultural events important? You know, if you think about how you socialize in your daily lives, you, you know, go out to dinner or you hang out on the weekends and you kind of sort of go with people from your neighborhood or from your church. Maybe they're from the same age group as you or the same economic background. But when you get together in a large global cultural event, like the CineQuest Film Festival, which draws over 100,000 people together from over 50 countries, we have over 700 artists and innovators that come in for the event, now you've got real power, right? Because you're sitting next to a billionaire, and maybe the person on the other side of you is living off credit cards, or they're from a different religious belief or country, um, or some kind of experience in their life that's very different from your own. And so when you come together in these big cultural events, these live events, the power of sharing and how you transform lives by becoming friends and sharing ideas um, can change the world. And so that's why we exist and what we're excited about. So thank you. Terrific. We, we just we just made one minute and twenty four seconds as well. That was terrific. Yeah. So uh, I saved it for Jim because I want to hear about all those great films. Oh, it's <laughs> it's great. There's a, there's a clock here in front of me. It's, it, they really are not messy. Yeah. Um, Senator Fiac McAneil, the floor is yours. For thank five you very minutes. much. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, and that was very interesting from Kathleen. What I want to pick up on from what Kathleen is saying is, she's, uh, is. Uh, we spoke about sharing, and the next word that comes to my mind is exchange. Uh, and it's, it kind of links in with the independence and interdependence uh, theme of the conference, but also about the, the Twin Cities and, and the twinning. I'm director of the Abbey Theatre, uh, an organization, the National Theatre, that's over 112 years old. And it has flourished because of exchange, exchange of ideas. Uh, but more importantly, it's exchange of travel. W.B. Yeats, who was one of the founders, first thing he, he understood uh, regarding how the Abbey should be sustainable and should exist was to travel straight away to the U.S. and gain friends uh, and raise money. And the Abbey Theatre, uh, its first ever tour to the, to the U.S. was in 1912. Uh, and it's been touring ever since. Now, I say that because Ultimately, for culture to transform lives, whether that actually can happen or not, but certainly culture can help explain lives and can help market and document it, exchange and culture exchange is very, very important. Maybe Jim might talk about film and how we love and grew up with American, American uh, movies. But in, in terms of theater, one of the most crucial kind of dynamic things that occurred was when a young American playwright saw the Abbey Theatre perform in New York City in 1913, uh, and later wrote in his diary that this is the type of work and type of writing he wants to do. And that was Eugene O'Neill. And without the visit of the Abbey Theatre to the US, one of the greatest Irish writers, arguably, indeed one of the greatest American writers, Eugene O'Neill. And I suppose Eugene O'Neill is, a, for me, a perfect manifestation of culture exchange, uh, mixed <coughs> identities, fusion. And that continued. Without Samuel Beckett, there'd be no Sam Shepard. Without Martin McDonough, without Sam Shepard, there'd be no Martin McDonough. Without David Mamet, there'd be no, uh, uh, there'd be no Conor McPherson or Mark O'Rourke. John Kelly w is much more, uh, I suppose, informed ar around music. But the fusion, the cultural exchange, often this happens out of, uh, by accident. But if anything that can come out of a, 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 a conference like this is to somehow understand, and Kathleen spoke very well, about how the local and how the informal and how the young, but also how artists can actually, uh, if they can exchange ideas or just give them time and space, whether that's San Jose and Dublin, whether it's uh, Belfast and, and Boston, it does allow culture exchange and more importantly, it allows for uh, a greater understanding of our lives, a greater understanding, and you can see that happening whether it's uh, particularly with writers in, in conflict zones, how we have to listen to them and understand that 
time is what they need and time is what, you need, what any community needs to get to, to understand and, and the creation of art take, it takes that time. So that's sustainability of culture exchange. Now, the US understood that uh, amazingly through the Cold War where they invested a lot of time and energy in culture diplomacy. They understood that by promoting American art that actually it could lead to an understanding, uh, uh, maybe skewed understanding, but certainly an understanding of a particular American society. In Ireland, we, we're beginning to, we understand that very well. We know uh, now sometimes our Irish government pays lip service to, to the support of Irish culture, but by using and, uh, and, and, and supporting Irish artists abroad, we begin to tell different stories, not just the one story. And that's what I think is quite exciting about uh, culture exchange, is that the more confusion we can create, uh, and the, the more diversity we can create, the more there'll be a greater understanding between the US and Ireland and between San Jose and Dublin. And I'm at 56 seconds. Thank you, Fear. <laughs> Don't applaud for too long, it's eaten into our time. Um, Jim Sheridan. There's still 42 seconds. Oh, well, sorry. use them, use them, use them. Go on, use them. I think I need go. a 10 second pause just to <laughs> get attention. Um, so, I don't, you know, culture, I, in making movies, had the horrible job of trying to make these Irish movies work. Uh, it's frozen on 4.59 now for me. It, it, it can't cope uh, with you, Jim. Time has stood still. <laughs> it's going again. But, you know, I had the job of making movies work in the US. And so, you know, the studio would always say, you know in Tootsie where they say it's on the coast and your man Hoffman says there's two coasts. Well, there's about four coasts in America. There's one with Mexico, one with the Pacific, the Atlantic and Canada. And all those cities you can put an independent movie into. But it's very hard to put an independent movie into the middle of America. And so they'd always say, you know, we're going to come out in the cities. And I'd be like, yeah, but Dallas is a city. But we never came out there. And it got me to thinking about two different Americas. Then I realized it was really the, just a framework of the Democratic and Republican parties. <laughs> uh, so, you know, then you realize there's probably two audiences in America and maybe there's not, maybe it's two different countries in terms of culture, in terms of penetration. And in Ireland, you know, you're, you're coming off a very small base. But I'll give you a secret. Everybody in the world thinks they're American. And we had a civil rights march where we don't have a Bill of Rights. So, this civil rights march led to a 30-year war. So people were walking for an impossibility. It's like, it's like trying to have a light bulb without an electrical system to walk for civil rights without a Bill of Rights. But people weren't aware of it because they'd seen American television. They'd seen Martin Luther King. They'd seen a spiritual leader. So what's always bugging me is where's the spirituality in what we're doing, even though I'm not very religious. So I'm going to explain how American culture came into my life. And so this is my house. And this is St. Lawrence O'Toole's Church, which is just down the road. And my dad gets up on the roof, and he's trying to turn the aerial towards the east. And I'm like, isn't that where the Magi looked, you know, in the Bible? You know, they all looked east. But it turned out England was east. And so he was trying to find England. And I said, but how do you know that's east? He said, doesn't the river Liffey run east? And I go, no, it goes in a circle like that. It starts in thing there. And he got mad at me, and he's like, turn the fucking thing east. <laughs> so I'm trying to, in freezing weather, trying to turn her east. He, and all he's getting is snow, snow, snow. So I'm like, it's OK. So he says, we'll try southeast, Harlech, Wales. There's a signal from there. Anyway, he's trying that for a while, he doesn't get out. And 
And then my uncle, who worked for Pi, a TV company, came along with what you need, which is a compass, which you now can get in your iPhone. And he found out that due east was the church. And the signal was hitting the church. <laughs> and it was bouncing up the road and forming up at that house, number 84. But as we're 44, we'd no reception. So what always occurred to me was that within the Late Late Show started in 62, so I would have been watching Laramie or something, and then the Late Late. And within 20 years of the Late Late, the occupancy of this went from 99% to 9%. That's culture. That's the power of television. It's the power of communication. Whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. But we seem to have replaced, you know, we just seem to have changed everything into, it's all about entertainment, it's all about, and it's none of it's about belief systems and whatever. So I'm kind of for trying to communicate and trying to form, you know, I run a little Arab film festival here. I make movies as best I can. But I think in the communication system, you need to find the spirit in the room, you know? You need to find some way of giving, other than America, a voice. And I don't mean that in any bad way. I love America, it's my favorite country. But we have to find a way of accepting other voices, hearing them, letting them in the room, and now letting them in the internet. So <clears throat> I'm going to go over to Cinequest and meet all the billionaires, okay? Okay. We'll come, we'll come back to that in a minute, Jim. Uh, so, a lot of what you said we will return to. Roshino is, is a very, very fine musician, singer, and uh, it's something that we have, we take great pride in our musicians here in particular. Roshino, the, the floor is now yours for Thanks. five minutes. <laughs> um, I'm very nervous to be here today. I'd be much more comfortable standing up here singing you a few songs rather than sharing the stage with these great speakers. But. Um, I suppose I can bring the voice of someone who's working in culture and, and uh, someone who has the direct experience of a cultural exchange with San Jose. Um, when I was in my second year at UCD, I decided to go on an exchange to America. And I really wanted to get out of my comfort zone and, and get some life experience and, and challenge myself to be more independent. And so began my year at San Jose State University. Um, the campus was unbelievable. It was, uh, you know, terracotta roofs and uh, palm trees lining the immaculately green grass around campus, and which was a far cry from UCD, which we used to nickname the concrete jungle. Um, but it was the whole year was an amazing experience. I I travelled all along the west coast. I met lifelong friends, but um, I really had the chance to get an insight into culture that I probably wouldn't have had in Dublin. Um, as I made the decision to live at the International House, which was home to 70 students from all over the world, from, from the US, but also from Australia, India, Japan, China, the list goes on and on. And um, meeting and really getting to know these students uh, was a great way of me to get out of the Irish bubble and, and see life from different perspectives. Um, one person I met who I, I suppose you could say she, she had a great influence of me uh, was a girl called Shirbano Khan from uh, Pakistan. Uh, she lived in the room next door to me, and um, I suppose I had never really engaged with Islam before this point in my life, and I only had the view that I had gained from, from media, which wasn't always entirely positive. Um, we didn't get on at first, it was nothing to do with culture, but only for the fact that she would blare pop music every morning at 8 a.m., and I liked my lions, but um, she was a devout Muslim, so she'd be up really early uh, doing her prayers, and she did that with, throughout the day, while also studying uh, molecular biology um, in San Jose and from uh, in a country that wasn't, didn't speak her own language on the other side of the world, you know. But I, uh, even though we had these differences, I found that we had, we had great similarities as well. Obviously, we had this huge love of, of music and modern music. And uh, also, uh, to my surprise, I found out that she was a strong women's rights activist. Um, this jarred slightly the view I had from TV and media of women in, in Islam, um, but it really opened my eyes as, as a 21-year-old at the time, you know, and we really became great friends. Um, this is just one example, but I think it gives you the idea that the only way to really get a real picture of something or someone is to have a direct experience, and this is, I think, what the Sister City program really promotes, you know. Um, sort of brings you back to our topic today, this idea of the power of culture to transform lives or bring about change. Um, 
you know, Shabana and I had been brought up in really different cultures, but we both could respect these cultures and had common ground of our generation's music and our generation's thoughts on, on equal rights. Um, and I think with, with the media today, with, with having the world at your fingertips in your iPhone or whatever, I think it, there's a blurring of, of national borders and boundaries and, and culture just isn't black and white anymore and it's much less defined. Um, and things like this exchange that I went on gives the opportunity to showcase not only traditional culture but, but more contemporary culture that, ha that, we, that has changed, as Jim said, the way 99% of people used to go to that church now, only 9% do. And while she was still a devout Muslim, she had so much in common with me being from my generation, you know. Um, while I was in San Jose, I, I sort of put music on the back burner a bit. Uh, I was enjoying the college life in the US, which was amazing, just to let you know. Um, but I didn't, I didn't perform my own music, because I am a singer-songwriter, I write my own music, but I, did, I took advantage of the preconceptions that many Americans had of Irish music, and that was this whole trad persona, you know, and I, I really cashed in on that. I, I played in Irish bars, I played at cultural events where people wanted me to singing Irish music. When Irish music is something I love, but it, it, it isn't what I do, and um, I think there is this preconceived notion of that Irish music equals trad or folk music, you know, but um, music, especially in Ireland, I think has begun to transcend culture. You know, we start off with these ideas of, of, of culture, of um, our traditional background, and we're influenced by our parents, by our friends, and we're influenced by music from abroad and, and from America. You know, some, today, some of our best musical exports are, have a mixture of cultural influences. Acts like Hosier and James Vincent McMurrah, Little Green Cars, you know, the list goes, goes on and on. Um, it's only now I see how hard it can be as an Irish contemporary musician to try and to get your music to other countries, uh, particularly in the States, where conceptions of Irish music can be sort of deeply ingrained in this idea of trad, you know. Um, this whole event today sort of brought to mind something our president, Michael D. Higgins, said in, during the 1916 commemorations, that history is, is complex and the only way to get an understanding of it is to be open to different views and create what he called a hospitality of narratives. And I think this applies to culture too. If we want to allow cultural growth, then we need to get rid of preconceptions around what, what nationality, gender, religion means for culture and create a hospitality of cultural narratives by accepting that we have a complexity of cultures. And um, just to finish, a Pakistani girl and an Irish girl singing Michael Jackson at 8 a.m. in their dorm might not be your stereotypical view of a cultural exchange, but it is opening their minds and educating them about something and it's achieving a goal, you know. Um, the Sister City program, I think, was a great vehicle to facilitate the hospitality of cultural narratives. And I, I was so grateful to get to go and have these experiences and have, meet these lifelong friends and to have the opportunity that it afforded me is sort of endless, you know, and I hope it continues to challenge our idea of culture. Thank you, Roshi, very much. <laughs> Jim, Jim, when I, when I saw that the theme of this, and, and I saw the word culture in the sentence, I kind of panicked a bit because it's one of those words that people have different ideas of what it is. Where I work in RTE, culture is used as this kind of thing, which uh, that's the kind of weird programs he does. As, as opposed to sport yeah, yeah, and politics yeah. and everything. So it's separate. Culture is the people in the, in the, in the foyer of the Abbey Theatre. That's, that's the cultured people, that, that sort of notion. But someone like you, Jim, uh, and your, your life history demonstrates that culture really is just the stuff that you get interested in and the stuff that you're exposed to and that if you're lucky you get to do. I mean, for you it was, it was movies, it was whatever books you came across, and then you followed that through and opened the project, and mm -hmm. that was all about bands and everything else. So, I mean, there is a narrow view, isn't there, that needs to be shaken? Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Um, I suppose I wasn't a good enough soccer player to be in the sports division, you know what I mean? Um, and in a way, it was kind of like an escape for me, you know, uh, just doing theater with my dad and just an escape from reality, from, you know, boring reality. We would do plays around the amateur drama circle, you know? But I bet at no point did you sit around thinking, we are now involved in culture. 
No, no, the opposite kind of, you know. Uh, though on the other hand, you know, it was Goebbels who said when he heard the word culture, he reached for his gun. <laughs> you know, so I think you do need a sense of civility and, you know, it's thin ice, you know. I think, I often think of like, you know, because you're doing stories and you're trying to think in narrative. And because I had to go to mass every day as an altar boy, that, that story used to be there every day. And it's like, this my body, this my blood. And I always was thinking, you know, that's a good story. That's a good gig, that one. Because that's, that's made more money than any other story. <laughs> Uh, and there's many variations of it, you know? <laughs> Catholic, Protestant, Presbyterian. I never knew what the word Presbyterian meant. I could kind of get Protestant, you know? But if you think of that story of this is my body, this is my blood, it's like, it's a positive reinforcement story, it's civility. It's kind of saying, don't think of animal sacrifice, don't think of blood sacrifice, Here's this magic trick I'm going to do for you. I'm going to show you the bread and say, that's my body. I'm going to show you wine and say, that's blood. And you're going to do it every day, OK? And not think about the really ugly thing that's underneath it. So it must mark a time in history where civility got a tin layer of ice. You know what I mean? Like, and it doesn't take much to crack the ice and go under it. And what was happening in, in, in Dublin, Jim, that prompted you and your brother and other people to start things like the project and start theatre and start pushing things out and, and, and introducing new things. I want to, you know, it's funny I could give you little things and everybody be saying, yeah, yeah, you know, but really what pushed me was religion and the impossibility of living a religious life as delineated to me by the church. You know, like, you couldn't have bad thoughts or impure actions. I was like, at what time in the morning did you get up? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, it was impossible to fulfill, to ful like there was a reality, a spiritual reality created that was a total lie. And so the theater always appeared as the alternative to that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like you say to God, okay, stop. You created that world, doesn't work, let's create this one. Isn't that what culture is? No, we've got a definition. Great. <laughs> there you go. But you know what I mean? It's like, isn't it, it has to be, on a simple level, it has to be about creating alternative reality. Okay. Yeah. Kathleen, when, when we're talking about culture in Ireland, we've, we've a sort of vague idea of what, it, what it's about. Does it, have a, does it have any different sense in the United States when, when people in, in public places talk about culture? Does it mean the same thing as it means here, do you think? Well, I, you know, the way we were talking about it earlier, where it's kind of like, oh, those artists, you know, they're part of that cultural groups and the artists and the poets. Um, I, think, I, I think it does have a much broader, bigger definition in the United States. I mean, you know, you take a look at Jim's films, for example, and that, that was my first introduction to the Irish culture, right? So watching My Left Foot or The Field or, you know, In the Name of the Father, you know, it was your first real introduction to, to a place and a group of people that were in another part of the world, and that was the Irish culture. And since then, of course, it's become much more than that, right? Because there's so many different cultures here in Ireland and so many, you know, groups of, of people and, and music and, and beliefs and religions. And, you know, it's a group of people that come together under some definition. And, and I, so I do think it is broad in the United States. You know, there's the Silicon Valley culture, which is very, very unique. Um, and... Um, so we don't look at it just as the arts, you know, it, it comes from, you know, you bring in religion, you bring in the economic factors, you bring in um, places of birth, you know, it's such a diverse community in the United States. We have people from all over the world that live there and are Americans. And so, it, you know, it's a very different place to think about culture.
culture sure. um, because of the diversity. Yeah, and, and that probably means we're going to have to change the way we think about it too. Fiat, uh, you touched on this in what you, in your opening remarks, and I want to ask you about this. When you, you you've had jobs in the past where you're you know um, uh, advisor to a government minister, say, or cultural programmer for things like the Irish presidency and uh, of, of the European Union, things like that. There is a sense abroad, isn't there, that, the, that, that governments, and our government in particular, have this idea that culture is this thing that can be taken, used, if there's a trade mission to China or America, wherever it is, send out the poets and the painters and all these guys first, send out the musicians, and they'll, do their, they'll work their charm and their magic on these people, and then, uh, then we can push them to one side and then do the serious business. There's a touch of that, isn't there, still abroad? Yeah, I mean, there is. I mean, um I mean, what Jim is saying is, is quite moving. Uh, what, I, what I think, um, when I describe what the role of the artist is in community, I'll extend the biblical uh, metaphor that, that uh, Jim is using. Is I do think they're prophets. I, do think, I, th I think somebody like Seamus Heaney, when he was alive, his poetry now continues to be about truth-telling, about truth-seeking, uh, about being the canary in the coal mine, or, or, or just trying to make sense of What's, what's going on, that sense where uh, an artist's antennae is so acute and so linked to the subconscious that if we allow ourselves to listen carefully, uh, we start to make sense. And, and you know, take a play uh, that Frank McGuinness wrote called Observe the Sons of Ulster Marches Towards the Psalm, which he wrote in the very early 80s, at the same time that Brian Freel wrote a play called Translations. Both those plays were, in my view, the beginning of the language around uh, what ended up culminating in the, in the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement. There were artists at the time engaging in an extraordinarily ambitious, risk-taking, innovative way around the use of language, around what it means to, to talk about our neighbor, looking east, as Jim says, looking to England. And, uh, and, and that was, and they're extraordinary and I think it's our responsibility, and, and, and Ireland is so used to centuries of, of, the, of the poet being a part, an essential part of the tribe. Now, to answer John's question, what happens is uh, there is a kind of a two-sided story to that in official government level, in that the, the, the poet is used to bring out a particular perceived message, uh, perhaps, unless the government itself is comfortable that diverse messages is the right way. But I think there might be a hint of that now that diverse messaging or diverse uh, storytelling is probably more, uh, uh, we're more at home with that now than we would have been, you know, five, yeah. ten years ago. And I think the more self-confident Ireland becomes around that, certainly through the, through the crisis, uh, uh, the extraordinary severe recession we've had, uh, uh, the poet, and the, uh, the, poet and, the, and the artist were the ones that were sent out by the government at the time because they're the ones that didn't let down the government. However, the irony of it is, is that funding has been drastically and savagely cut in the meantime. So there is a, there's, there's a sense, and that's all to do with the artistic community. The artistic community needs to become much more political, much more active in making a sense, making, making a connection with their own future and governing their own future. And you can see that, you can see the, the leadership that, say, Bruce Springsteen uh, has, uh, has created recently in, in, in cancelling a concert in, 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 in the state around making those, and, and there's a kind of a tradition of that that actually uh, we should admire and we should replicate, and, and sometimes we do. And so there is, a, uh, but at the same time, artists do want to represent the country. Yeah. You know, the artists do want to be on the national stage, international stage, and I think that that's not a contradiction either. I think there's a, there's a pride, a sense of pride, where somebody like Roshi you know, or Jim are representing their nation. Uh, when, when, uh, and, and that's something that reflects back on us and reflects back on, on younger artists as well, that they will see really good, proper role models. And Jim is an example where Jim opened the floodgate for a lot of amazing further generation of filmmakers and artists to kind of be themselves, tell a local story. And that's what, that's what Jim was brilliant at. And I suppose that's something we learn. When we, as much as we love America, and I do, the more local our story is, the more powerful it is internationally. And he understood that. And Jim Sheridan certainly understood that. Roisin, um, you know, the, I bet you, you know, among the musicians you, you play with now, the, the, the whole idea of culture, or maybe even Irish culture, it doesn't even figure, you know, you're just playing music, you're 
enjoying what you do, and it's also, it's your job, it's business as well, you know? So is this, is this conversation, do you feel at all relevant to what you do as a musician? what we do and it's what we do every day and I suppose we don't think of it as a thing that it has a has a headline you know but um it's it's really you know as I was trying to say in a point in my in my piece that there is so much great music coming out of Ireland that is Irish music but it is ingrainedly Irish and it has those influences but it has influences from so many other parts of the world as well particularly America you know and you see that uh, across the board, but um, you know, even as as Speak spoke about, uh, you know, how well the government and the state departments are working together. You know, I think that's something that RTE did recently with the centenary program. It was they mixed the contemporary music with traditional music, and it, it worked so well, and it it showed Ireland to the world as it is. You know, and it, it's not just trad or it's not just X and Y. It's it's this this mix of of everything that's all the influences from our past and from from now and what we what we are experiencing from being so connected as a as a planet you know in, in our different cultures um, it's extraordinary how, how, how things have moved on you know just listen to what you're saying there Roshan I, I heard the president speak at something quite recently and it, within five minutes he had mentioned uh, Descartes Brenton Behan and David Bowie yeah. you know and apart from we, we, we know we've got a cool president but but those reference points, they're all there. I mean, today, the newspaper, the fronts of all newspapers, is Prince, yeah. you know, and the, 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 the cultural impact of the likes of Prince, and thank God people like Springsteen are still alive, um, is, is no longer up for dispute or up for debate, which I think is quite interesting. Jim, you, you got involved with American pop culture, with, I mean, 50 Cent, for instance. Do you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we didn't see that coming. We really didn't. Yeah, that was a, a weird one, you know, it was just true Bono knew Jimmy Iovine who knew 50 Cent, you know. Uh, I always liked the American rap culture because uh, it's very verbal, Irish is very, and we're very verbal, you know. So that was just, if you talk about a culture clash, that was very interesting, you know. Tell me what, well, right, what happened day one, Jim Sheridan, Fiddy. I'm, I'm going to make a movie. Here's what you're going to do, Fiddy. How did that work? Pretty weird. Like, <laughs> he was like the hardest worker I ever met. Um, but he was also odd, you know, in, in certain ways. You know, he would like, um, he would go around the Bronx with $1,000, you know, like $100 bill. 10 tens and 900 one dollar bills and he'd throw them up in the air and I'd be like look 50 I can get an audience if I do that you know <laughs> but he, he thought he was like Robin Hood and he would sometimes do it on the set and it got so dangerous I told him to stop and he you know okay I'll stop then I rang the head of the studio said this is dangerous then I told his manager and he promised to stop and then he went up in the car and threw it again and I lost him head, you know? The 50, if you're a gangster, shoot somebody. Don't be throwing money up in the air <laughs> for kids to get hurt, you know? So he kind of came out of the, and, and I, I was wise enough to, that I'd watched all the CCTV footage of the fights, so I knew the guy with the knife as opposed to the guy with the gun. So I was standing right beside the guy with the knife in case he made a move when I gave out to him. And, uh, and 50 was, was amazing. He came out and he was like, look, I'm sorry, I apologize. And I had a list like that pre-done of about nine people that he had to apologize to. And I gave it to him and he rang every one of them. And then he said, I never had a dad. Wow. You know? So it was kind of like a culture more extreme than ours without fathers. You know, we have a very dominant father culture. You know, if you think of play by the Western world, or you think of, but that's a different culture where there's, the fathers aren't present, you know? So, 
And was, was the culture clash in any way softened by the fact that you're from Sheriff Street? Yeah, totally. Like, he gets it. You get that. That's body language. Like, if you look at... Because Sheriff Street's kind of like the hood here. Yeah, you know? it's kind of like South Central, you yeah. know? <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm fascinated by... You know, Fake was talking about, like, Yates, and we were the first country to give, Ye to give a grant to start a theatre to any arts, because Ireland's a figment of an imagination of poets and rich people in New York in big houses. <laughs> and so there's that big coo-hull inside of it, you know, and the whole, oh, we're a nation. And the other side is kind of like leprechauns, you know, which is peasant culture. You know, like it's kabuki or no theater, <laughs> you know. And it's like peasant culture or rich culture, you know. <laughs> and kind of our, the, the nation came out of a rich culture, I'd say, and we're afraid of the leprechaun, and it's there in the Patrick's Day Parade. Yeah. But we're the only nation, I think white nation, that kind of has a, pa a parade like all the South Americans. You know, you have the Puerto Rican parade and the Brazilian parade and the Mardi Gras and Patrick's Day, but you don't have an English parade in New York. You know, you don't have a Scottish one. Because they actually, that's the red states. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So we're, we're, we're in into, the Irish are a kind of weird, they, they mix with everybody, don't they? Yeah. 